President Yoon Sung-yeol to embark on a state visit to the U.S., marking seven years of the Seoul-Washington alliance. What's in store for his trip, and how would it serve to boost the partnership moving forward and beyond security? South Korea pushed Japan back on its wild list of favored trading nations in its latest move to mend bilateral ties. In the conflict hit Sudan, countries are rushing to evacuate their nationals, with South Korea also gearing up for its own evacuation. Good afternoon. We start with President Yoon Suk Yeol's state visit to the U.S., marking seven years of the Seoul-Washington alliance. The president will be meeting his U.S. counterpart Joe Biden, as well as the country's political and business leaders, seeking to expand ties. Our Chen Min Jung breaks down what is in store for the president's trip. South Korean President Yoon Suk Yeol embarks on an official state visit to Washington on Monday, where he'll meet his U.S. counterpart Joe Biden. Under the theme Alliance in Action Toward the Future, his trip is expected to strengthen the Seoul-Washington alliance, especially as this year marks the 70th anniversary of the alliance between both nations. The state visit officially begins on Tuesday. Yoon will attend a forum where advanced technology companies in the U.S. will announce plans to invest in South Korea and a business roundtable involving some 30 CEOs of major companies from both countries. The president will also visit NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center to discuss space cooperation between the two countries. Also on Tuesday, both leaders and the first ladies will pay a visit to the Korean War Veterans Memorial in Washington. Wednesday is the highlight of the visit. Yoon's summit with U.S. President Joe Biden will take place at the White House. Prior to the summit, Biden and the first lady will host an official arrival ceremony. The summit will be followed by a joint press conference and a state dinner. On Thursday, Yoon will address Congress on the topic of liberal democracy and share his blueprint for the future of the bilateral alliance. The speech will be followed by lunch at the State Department, hosted by U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris and Secretary of State Antony Blinken. Yoon will then receive a briefing from top U.S. military officials on a variety of global issues. The president will also make a stop in Boston to meet academics from the digital and biosector at MIT on Friday. He will also host a panel session at Harvard University's Kennedy School on economic freedom and liberal democracy on the same day. From there, Yoon will wrap up his trip and depart for Seoul on Saturday. Choi min Arirang News. The upcoming Yoon Biden summit will likely address security as a key agenda as it comes amid advancing nuclear and missile threats from North Korea. But with a large business delegation also accompanying the president, cooperation in the tax sector and the U.S. subsidy issues surrounding the domestic auto industry could also be addressed. Our presidential office correspondent Oh Soo Young has the possible items on the agenda. The first official U.S. state visit in 12 years for a South Korean leader. The highlight of Yoon's trip will undoubtedly be his summit on Wednesday with U.S. President Joe Biden. The commanders-in-chief are expected to first and foremost address security challenges, namely North Korea's growing nuclear weapons capabilities. The U.S. deterrence uh, hasn't kept up with the advancements made by North Korea on the nuclear front. So I think the South Korean government would like the United States to put forward uh, more uh, complex and uh, sophisticated response measures that are more visible to the South Korean public in order to reassure the country against the growing North Korea's nuclear threat. President Yoon himself has been pushing for Seoul to have greater involvement in the joint planning and execution of Washington's nuclear weapons operations upon a nuclear attack by Pyongyang. He's called for measures stronger than NATO's nuclear sharing arrangement with the U.S., under which Washington deploys tactical nuclear weapons in Germany and Italy and operates them after consultation. Another major aspect of Yoon's trip will be economic security, with seven major business-related events. Yoon's top priority on that front will be gaining some leeway for South Korean auto and tech firms adversely affected by America's industrial policies, chiefly the Inflation Reduction Act and the Chips and Science Act. 
Dubbing himself the country's number one salesman, Yoon is taking some 122 business people, including the chiefs of Samsung, SK, LG, Lotte and Hyundai, to expand partnerships and investments, particularly in high-tech areas, including the digital sector, biopharmaceuticals and even media contents. Beyond commercial ties, the South Korean president will aim to forge partnerships in research and development in cutting-edge areas. As the U.S. is an advanced science and tech powerhouse with core technologies, strengthening cooperation with South Korea, which has strengths in manufacturing, is expected to see great synergy. During this state visit, we will strengthen cooperation in fields such as advanced semiconductors, biotech, space and quantum AI. During his week-long stay in Washington, D.C. and Boston, Yoon will focus on aiming to transform the traditional security alliance upon its 70th anniversary to a global strategic comprehensive partnership with tangible outcomes outlined in a joint statement by the two leaders following their summit talks on Wednesday. Oh Seung, Arirang News. While President Yoon sung yeol has been in the office for less than a year, he's looking for a sixth face-to-face -face already with his U.S. counterpart, Joe Biden. What have been discussed in their past meetings leading up to this summit? Our Kim do Young takes a look. Less than a year since he took office, President Yoon sung yeol has met U.S. President Joe Biden on at least five occasions. The first was a summit in May as Biden came to Seoul just 10 days after Yoon's inauguration and made a wide range of bilateral issues. The first was supply chain cooperation, which Biden emphasized as he went straight to a Samsung semiconductor plant in Pyeongtaek, and the two presidents met for the first time. Our two nations work together to make the best, most advanced technology in the world, and this factory is proof of that. And that gives both the Republic of Korea and the United States a competitive edge in the global economy if, if we can keep our supply chains resilient, reliable, and secure. And for South Korea, it was a turning point in the ROK-U.S. alliance, as the joint statement following the summit clearly showed the two countries would focus even more on economic cooperation beyond traditional security issues. But that wasn't to say security was neglected amid North Korea's growing nuclear and missile threat. The two reaffirmed Washington's extended deterrence commitment to Seoul, which entails a full range of U.S. defense capabilities, including nuclear, conventional and missile defense. They agreed to reactivate their high-level extended deterrence talks, after which the two sides have bolstered joint military drills and exchanges. Yoon and Biden's second meeting came one month later during Yoon's trip to the NATO summit in Madrid. Joined by Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, the three discussed North Korea's increasing missile provocations and agreed to strengthen joint defense measures. Yoon and Biden also had a chance to meet on the sidelines of Phnom Penh ASEAN summit, their third meeting in November. Came after South Korea voiced concerns over the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act, which put Korean automakers at a disadvantage in the American market. That said, Yoon relayed his concerns to Biden during their almost hour-long meeting. Other brief tete-a-tetes took place in London during Queen Elizabeth II's funeral and the UN General Assembly. As the two are now very well acquainted, Seoul's top office says Yoon's state visit to D.C. will be able to expand the strategic bilateral partnership even further. Kim do Arirang News. In its latest move to mend bilateral ties with Tokyo, South Korea has restored Japan to its list of preferential trading nations. In the meantime, the country has introduced tougher restrictions on Russia and Belarus, joining international efforts to control their military capabilities against Ukraine. Our Moon Arian has the details. Japan is back on Seoul's white list of trading partners for the first time in three years. The Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy released a notice on Monday to make amendments to the country's white list of strategic goods export destinations, reinstating Japan back in the top tier class of trading partner nations and merging the two top classes of nations together. Back in 2019, Seoul removed Japan from the whitelist in response to Tokyo's implementation of licensing requirements for the export of key materials needed for the production of displays and semiconductors, fluorinated polyamide, hydrogen fluoride and photoresists. 
Following the bilateral summit between South Korea and Japan last month, Tokyo lifted these export restrictions, prompting Seoul to respond by placing Japan back on the whitelist. The whitelist consists of different tiers that have varying benefits, and the trade ministry's decision to tie the top two tiers together puts Japan in the top tier alongside 28 other nations, including the UK and the United States. This means that South Korean firms exporting goods to Japan now only need to fill out three application forms instead of the standard five, and the permit review period is five days instead of 15. It's expected that Japan will reciprocate by putting Seoul back on its whitelist too, but the process will likely take longer as the move needs to be discussed in a cabinet meeting unlike in South Korea, where it just needs to be notified through the trade ministry. Meanwhile, Seoul will be strengthening its export restrictions to Russia and Belarus starting this Friday in light of the prolonged war in Ukraine. The ministry added 741 more items to its previous list of 57 banned items for export to the two countries, bringing the total of restricted items to 798. These new items include semiconductors such as DRAM memory chips, vehicles exceeding 50,000 US dollars in value, construction machinery and steel and chemical products, items that can be used to develop and enhance military capability. The list reflects four international agreements such as the Wassenha Agreement and the Nuclear Suppliers Group, all which aim to prevent aid in warfare through the control of exports. Moon hye Arirang News. Amid a Seoul-Beijing diplomatic row over President Yoon's remarks on Taiwan, a South Korean envoy to China stressed that Seoul supports peace in the Taiwan Strait. According to Seoul's foreign ministry, South Korea's ambassador to China, Chong jae ho told Beijing's vice foreign minister, Sun Wei-dong, in a phone call that South Korea hopes for peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait and it adheres to the one-China policy. Beijing's foreign ministry belatedly revealed details of Thursday's phone call, which is said was made to lodge a complaint over Yoon's recent interview with voters on South Korea's opposition to any attempts to change the status quo in the Taiwan Strait by force. During the phone call, the vice FM said that Beijing's controversial remarks, which referred to Yoon's interview as meddling, was not directly aimed at the president. Illegal shipments to North Korea seem to have increased significantly this year. The Voice of America reported on Sunday that 36 suspected cases had already been detected in the West Sea. That's the same amount of cases detected as the whole of last year, and it's only April. It is suspected that North Korea is using a new method of ship-to-ship -ship transfers in its own territorial waters to avoid sanctions. VOA added that it is possible that these illegal shipments could be associated with the increased coal and oil imports. Over in Sudan, as fighting between rival factions continues, more countries are rushing to evacuate their nationals. South Korea is also gearing up to execute its own exodus operation. Our Lee sung has the latest. Hundreds of foreign nationals living in war-torn Sudan are being evacuated by their countries. Many of the rescued have already arrived at a port in Saudi Arabia. The mass evacuation comes as the two rival factions fighting in the northeast African country have agreed to allow foreign nationals to be safely evacuated from Sudan. Last night, the British military conducted an evacuation operation of British diplomatic staff and the dependents from Khartoum. Uh, using elements of 16 Air Assault Brigade, the Royal uh, Air Force and the Royal Marines, uh, over 1,200 people uh, contributed to this operation. South Korea has also begun its evacuation process as an aircraft landed at a U.S. base in Djibouti on Saturday. As the airport in the Sudanese capital of Khartoum is currently closed, the 29 South Korean nationals in Sudan will be moved to the aircraft by the Chang'e unit, a South Korean naval task force operating in the region. Meanwhile, speaking during Sunday prayer in St. Peter's Square, Pope Francis called for an immediate end to violence in Sudan. Unfortunately, the situation in Sudan remains serious, so I renew my appeal for a quick end to the violence and a return to the path of dialogue. I invite everyone to pray for our Sudanese brothers and sisters. 
the deadly clashes between the Sudanese armed forces and rapid support forces have been intensifying despite a 72-hour ceasefire declared for the Muslim holiday of Eid. Lee seung Arirang News. Prime Minister Han duk -soo has called on relevant ministries, including the Foreign Affairs Ministry, to fully support the President's visit to the United States. This as the PM presided over a cabinet meeting on Monday. He also called for the ministries to do their best to make sure follow-up actions after the visit maximize its achievements. Also discussed at the meeting were the measures to extend the temporary fuel tax reduction until the end of August, as well as measures to temporarily cut customs tariffs for seven selected grocery items that greatly affect food prices. In the wake of the recent housing rental fraud cases that have resulted in a number of people failing to get their deposits back or others facing eviction, the government is looking to introduce a special law aimed at ensuring victims keep their place to live. Our political correspondent Ishi Hu reports. The government and the ruling People Power Party on Sunday announced relief measures to help the victims of real estate rental scams sweeping across South Korea. A temporary special law will give the victims priority purchasing rights for affected properties, tax cuts and loan support. The Korea Land and Housing Corporation will use priority purchasing rights to turn affected properties into public housing for victims. The government and the PPP will guarantee the tenants' right to reside through the special law. We will make it so that victims can reside affordably in the long term without worrying about eviction. Also beginning Monday, the victims who received loans from commercial banks to pay for housing can switch to lower interest loans. Uri Bank is the first to begin allowing switches with Kungmin, Shinan, Hana and Nongya banks to follow next month. Now these moves follow the third apparent suicide of a victim of real estate fraud related to South Korea's unique Chunsei rental system. Lee si hu Arirang News. Seoul City will turn into a huge cultural festival, offering an opportunity to fully enjoy everything the nation's capital has to offer. Seoul Festa 2023 begins this weekend with an eight-day event to highlight K-culture through a variety of activities under the theme of Feel the Real Seoul. Kwang Ha Moon Square in the downtown Seoul will be transformed into Seoul Culture Square for the festival and host the main events. Activities include a Korean makeup program as well as an LED video photo booth featuring K-pop stars such as IVE and Hyphen. The festival runs until May 7th. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. In Kenya, 47 bodies, including those of children, were discovered over the weekend amid an investigation into a Christian cult. The bodies were buried in shallow graves on private land owned by a pastor close to the coastal town of Malindi. The number of dead is expected to rise as authorities say up to 58 graves have been found in the area. The grim discovery comes after authorities last week rescued 15 emaciated people from the Good News International Church. Four of them died shortly after. The victims had reportedly been told by their pastor that they would be able to meet Jesus if they starved themselves. The pastor is in police custody and has been arrested already twice before on charges related to the deaths of children, but was released on bail both times. The pastor has denied any wrongdoing and insists he shut down his church in 2019. Moving over to the UK now, it was an ending fit for Hollywood at the racecourse ground on Saturday evening local time when Wrexham AFC came from behind to beat Boreham Wood 3-1 and secure promotion to the Football League. The promotion means that Wrexham will compete in a tougher League 2 next season. It's the fourth tier of the English Football League and three promotions away from the English Premier League. The team had previously struggled in the fifth tier, spending 15 years in the National League. But Wrexham's fortunes have changed since being taken over by Hollywood actors Ryan Reynolds and Rob McElhenney in 2021. 
Now from New York and London to Peru, activists around the world rallied over the weekend to mark Earth Day. For five hours on Saturday, New York banned cars from 31 locations in the city. Meanwhile, in London, activists from the Extinction Rebellion group started a four-day action on Friday called the Big One. It gathered people from all movements to protest for climate action in front of the Houses of Parliament. Held every April 22nd, Earth Day aims to demonstrate support for environmental protection. The rallies come amid weeks of extreme weather, including heat waves in Thailand and India, and record low levels of snowfall for Europe. And finally, from Harry Potter ones to Star Wars costumes, a collection of over 100 years worth of iconic Hollywood items went under the hammer over the weekend. Around 1,400 props were in the two-day auction organized by Julian's Auctions in Beverly Hills. These included the hoverboard from Back to the Future, as well as items from the 1917 film Cleopatra. But the main feature of the auction was the iconic three-piece white suit worn by actor John Travolta in the movie Saturday Night Fever. It sold for $260,000 and is one of only two known suits that were used in the movie's production. Matthew Ashley, Arirang News. Good afternoon. The last work week of April began on a pleasant note with much improved air quality. Temperatures are similar to yesterday in central regions, but eastern parts of the country are having cooler highs due to easterly winds. But air becomes dry again. West of central region is under a dry weather advisory along with strong winds, so please be careful with anything that could cause a spark. Meanwhile, Jeju and Jeollanam-do province could see some passing rain in the afternoon, but it will be less than 5 millimeters. Sunny skies in central regions today, but southern provinces are having highs to the 4 degrees lower than yesterday, hovering in the mid to upper teens with lots of clouds. Then we have some rain in the forecast tomorrow. The further south you are, the heavier the rain falls. In Jeju, we'll see up to 30 millimeters, which should all let up by Tuesday night. That rain will also drag down the highs to the much cooler side on the same day. And it's going to stay breezier through the first half of the week. That's Korea for you, and here's a look at the international weather conditions. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great rest of the day.